you get a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a military guy and he actually asks you, what part of the military do you want to join? And my answer was, well, I'm not going to join. Uh, he really went berserk. I really had to choose uh, army, navy, air force, whatsoever. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's great that, you, that you're asking that question, but it's just not going to happen. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list to keep up with the latest episode. In 1987, Martin received a letter informing him of his conscription into the Dutch army. A number of European NATO countries had conscription during the Cold War. Holland's applied to men over the age of 18 and included service for about a year after which you were placed on the Army Reserve. Martin objected to military service as a conscientious objector on religious grounds. Conscientious objectors could perform an alternative civilian service instead of military service. However, to get to be an official conscientious objector, you had to pass multiple military courts and military procedures, which was especially challenging for somebody aged 17 years old. Martin is very honest about his beliefs and his experiences. It was tough for him, and during the Cold War, he was seen by some as an enemy because he refused to bear arms to protect his country. You may disagree with his views, but it's a Cold War topic that's little covered elsewhere, and I'm sure you will find my conversation with Martin as fascinating and as powerful as I did. Now, Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will help keep this podcast on the air. You'll be part of our community, you'll get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hi, this is Rhonda in Virginia, and I support Cold War Conversations because I think the work that Ian is doing is critically important. I think it's vital to record the first-hand accounts of people who lived and experienced the Cold War. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Martin to our Cold War conversation. I grew up in a time with uh, Brezhnev, Andropov, uh, Gorbachev, Chernyenko. And on the other side, of course, there were the American guys, uh, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan. And I do remember those presidents, but I don't remember the Dutch presidents. I'm from the Netherlands, and I can't remember any of the Dutch presidents. They just didn't make an impact at all. But I do remember the Russian ones and the American ones. Um, so the Cold War for us was not that cold. Uh, we were raised with the Russians could show up any minute. They were definitely red and communist and had horns or something like that. They, they were pretty evil in, in what we were told. Um, so, yeah, that, that was quite exciting, to be honest. Um, the Warsaw Pact, of course, still did exist. Um, and the situation was actually told pretty black and white. It was the West against the East. And there was not a gray... Well, there, there wasn't gray. It just didn't exist. Uh, which, for me, I thought that was funny. And it got me thinking about military service and what to do. The, the draft still existed back that, back in those days in the Netherlands. So everybody between the ages of 17 and I guess 45, something like that, had to serve into the military. My family smuggled uh, relief goods to Russia when it still was the USSR. They smuggled Bibles to Russia when it still was the USSR. Uh, freedom of religion was definitely not, not there. And they also told me the stories about the people who lived there. And it was, yeah, it was poverty, but they also gave me some insight that the people that are living there are actually the same as you and I. They are just born somewhere else. Did your, your family have strong religious beliefs? Well, I don't think it's strong religious beliefs. They, they, 
my mom and dad were hippies back in the days. Uh, yes, they do believe uh, in God, but not in a normal sense. They were very much into do make sure that what you do is what you really believe in and don't automatically believe what anybody else tells you. Um, so, no, I, I don't think they were strict religious. Um, they were more very conscious, I guess. What age were you when you get your draft letter? I presume it's a letter is the way it's communicated. Yeah, yeah, you, you get one of those letters. It's it's pretty well, you, you know, they're they're pretty formal. Uh you're you're the age of 17, 18. So yeah, l- let's be honest. I mean, what do you know when you're 17 or 18? It, it's the age that you think that you know everything, but in <laughs> in all honesty, what do you know when you're 17 or 18? Um and I always thought that was pretty pretty wild. Uh you have to make quite big decisions in a pretty young age. And those decisions, if you get drafted into the military in the Netherlands back then, you got drafted when you're 17 or 18 years old and they could call you up to go into the army until the age of 45. So you have to make a decision when you're 17 years old, but that decision will stay with you at least until you're 45. And that's that's quite a long period of time. Um, and I always thought that was, it's the same as choosing a school or what do you want to become when you grow, when you grow old, do you want to become a police officer or a pilot or I don't know what you have to make the decision around the same age, 17, 17 years old. I mean, what do you know? What were your friends views on serving in the military? Well, I mean, 99% just went into the military. Uh, when you ask them, uh, are you going to join? Yes or no? Yes, yes, of course I do. And when you would ask them why, uh, the answer was 99% well, just because we have to. And just like they didn't think of it at all, it was some sort of automatically, which I always thought was, yeah, it was weird. At least it's, a, it's quite a big step what you're, what you're doing. And whichever step you take, I'm fine with it. If you go left or you go right, it's fine. But at least think about it. But for me, it looked like my friends just didn't think about it at all. They just joined. About 50% were hoping that they didn't go through uh, the medical exam, that they got flat feet or something like that so that they could chicken out. And I always thought that was weird as well. I mean, come on. You have to serve your country in one way or the other. Uh, What's wrong with that? So, yeah, but but 99%, they just joined fully automatically, don't think anything of it. How long is the national service? How how long or how regularly are you, are you going to get called up for training and, and things like that to keep you fresh? Yeah, back then I got drafted in 1987. And back then uh, it was one year if you went into the military service. But if you would like to apply for a uh, conscientious objector, then you had to serve for one and a half years. So the military service was one year and um, the alternative was one and a half year. The other alternative was don't join the army at all, don't do anything at all. And then, then you had to go to jail for 23 months as far as I can remember. So you actually had three options. Well, options. The last one wasn't an option, but okay. Some people thought it was. You know, I've seen photos of some of the Dutch soldiers with their long hair and yeah, all of that. Is that from the seventies or eighties? That those sort of photos? That, yeah, that's from the same period of time, uh, and that was also a sign for me. I mean, well, you're joining the army, which is quite a serious business, as far as I can see it, and you might as well take it serious. Um, the stories that I heard from my friends who actually went into the army were not that great at all. And that really got me thinking, I mean, come on. I mean, is this, is this an army that God has his hand in or something like that? This just looks like chaos. Some of the guys had to, um, had to paint their truck four five, six times a year just because they needed something to do. 
uh, I heard the wild stories and I was like, well, th this doesn't like God has a hand in this at all. That also gave me doubts. What, what, what are you going to do there for a year? Are you really serving your country there for a year or are you just hanging in there? Let's get it over with as soon as possible and let's get back home. I mean, that's, no, that's either you go for it or you don't. That that's at least that's my opinion. Yeah, and didn't the Dutch army also have a trade union? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did back in the day. Yeah, they definitely did. Which is yeah, I, I don't get it. But hey, that's that's my yeah, that's my opinion. So you get the letter and you're told to report somewhere. I'm presuming. Yeah. Yeah. So what what did you do at that point? Well, th th there is th there's one point before that actually. You have the legal option to sign up as a conscientious objector. However, it doesn't work automatically. Not at all. Uh, it's a law from 1972. There were a couple of laws before that where it was not allowed. That it, it was actually a criminal offense if you didn't want to go into the army that did change in 96 um that they, they would allow people to apply for that but only if they said that all taking of life uh, is wrong even in self-defense or in a just war so it's quite strict it's quite black and white and when you look at the laws they are pretty pretty strict i mean it's military law it's just it's it's not there for fun uh, so you had to write a letter to the uh, objections bureau of the ministry of defense uh, to a start an appeal and b uh, write your motivation so it's not like uh child a box i would like to appeal and that's it no you really had to write a serious letter what what your thoughts were uh but there, you, then you're not there yet then you get invited to go for a talk with a psychiatrist that's a one-on-one -on -one conversation to see if you're mentally uh, well good enough i guess um then you're not there yet then you'll have to appear before a committee first you have to appear before a single judge and when the single judge is convinced that your objections are um well how would you say it that they are real objections and that not just a thought or something like that, then she would say, or he or she would say, it's okay and now it's official. But I never heard that that actually happened. Everybody I talked to had to go to a second, some sort of court. At least three people were in front of you. Um, and you had to appeal your, and you had to appear before that advisory committee. So it was quite something. It was not like uh, writing a writing a letter and that's it. On the contrary, um, and then they may recognize you as an objector uh, and watch out for the may. Not everybody got approved. On the contrary, uh, the funny thing is, uh, if if you get the letter, that's also funny. If you do get the letter, you still have to go for your medical exams, and that was actually a great story. So they gave you the letter, they give you a train ticket to go for your medical exam in whatever uh, city that was. And they check what your height is and if you're mentally stable and if your eyes are okay, just, just the normal regular stuff. And in the middle of that medical exam, you get a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a military guy and he actually asks you, what part of the military do you want to join? And my answer was, well, I'm not going to join. Uh, so, well, it's, yeah, it's a great question, but I can't answer it to you. Well, he, he really went postal. Uh, he really went berserk. I really had to choose uh, army, navy, air force whatsoever. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's great that, you, that you're asking that question, but it's just not going to happen. So that, got, that he actually quite, got quite pissed about it. But I was like, well, hey, it's the law. I can go into the army or I can object against it. I'm not doing anything illegal. I do want to follow the law and I do want to uh, serve my country. Um, and if they don't 
allow me to do this, well, then I'll have to join the army. It is how it is. But he just couldn't handle that. He got really, um, well, he got pretty angry. <laughs> he got pretty angry. So that was quite funny. What were your grounds for objecting to uh, carrying? I'm presuming you were objecting to carrying arms. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, well, I looked it up last week. I still got the papers. Um, I still got the letter that I wrote. And when you have to appear for the committee, you have to do that on your own. Uh, there's no lawyer with you, no nothing. So you're in front of three adults uh, in military uniform. They are very strict. Uh, and they have the right to do so. I mean, it's it's some sort of military committee. So, yeah, that's that's the way it is. But you're 17 years old, so that's quite, a, quite an impressive thingy. Um, there's nobody to help you there. You're on your own. So I took a tape recorder with me and tape and recorded everything without them telling that I did it. So afterwards, I listened to my own recording and typed it all out. Since when they decline your application, you have to go before a second committee and you better, you better make sure that your story is 100% the same. It doesn't feel like a nice conversation with a cup of coffee. Just, uh, let's say <laughs> that. It, it's really yeah. a military court. Um, it really feels like that. And you better prepare for it. So I've got, uh, yeah, I actually got uh, the questions that they asked me. Maybe that's that's an interesting thing. Uh, one of the questions they asked me, our army is defensive and not offensive. We are here to protect people. And you'll have to you'll have to answer that question. Um, so my answer to that was back then, the people in the other side of the line probably believe the same. And if we look at the history books, many countries did bad stuff, but they truly believed it was in the interest of the country. And the other thing is governments do change. You call me up when I'm 17, uh, until I'm 45 years old, I still have to show up and governments do change. So what will happen in the next 28 years? I don't know. And I just can't take that risk. So that was the end of that conversation. How did they respond to that? Or do they just note it down and not respond? Or And sometimes they, they do respond. So some of the objectors actually studied all the questions. It, it's the same as your theoretical driving exam. If, if you practice the question a, a gazillion times, then you'll pass. But do you really know what, what it is? You don't. You don't have a clue. So they try to figure out, is it really your answer? Or is it something that you studied on or not? So that's, that's what they try to figure out. Uh, so, for, so, in, so for the first question, that was it. They didn't ask any more questions. Um, the, the, the second question was a more, well, for them, it was a more difficult one. Uh, they asked me, there are a lot of Christians in the army and they do believe that we have to follow the government and that God gives us the right to defend ourselves. Um, so, well, then they start to poke a little bit harder and I do get it. I mean, it's their job. Yeah. They're getting paid for it. Um, and my answer was that, well, and I still believe that. Don't get me wrong. I, I do want to follow what the government does. And there is a law made in 1963 and I do want to follow that law. Um, the only thing is, is this government led by God? I do believe that they are established by God, but do I believe, do they listen to God? That's a different, that's a different thing. There is a Bible verse in Romans 13 that says, oh, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. So that's, that's pretty clear. You have to listen to your government, full stop. But when I show up to God at the pearly gates, I have to answer to God. And for me, it doesn't work that I'm going to say, well, everybody joined the army. So that's what I did as well. I mean, you've got your own consciousness uh, and you have to answer for your own. But they, they really start to poke into it. But it's okay. But when you're 17 years old, it's quite, um, it's quite impressive. What other questions do they ask you to try and uh, undermine your position? Well, that, that, that's, those are two. Uh, there's another one. 
can you join the army if we send you off to the medical corps, for instance? Then you don't have to fight. And then you actually are working for a good cause. Uh, you help people instead of killing them. And my answer was, well, do I still have to do boot camp? And are you still going to train me uh, to shoot a gun or to kill people? And their answer was, yes, you have to. Everybody has to go through boot camp. Well, then it's not possible for me to work in the medical corps. It just doesn't work like that. Um, if you would say you could join the medical corps without the military training, okay, that's no problem. Uh, but, hey, you're still trying to learn me how to kill people. So it's questions like that. Um, the, the really tricky one, and they ask that to everybody, and I do get it where they're, where they're coming from. Uh, what are you going to do if you're threatened or if your wife is threatened in the future? Um, somebody's pulling a gun on you. Are you going to defend yourself? Which is an honest question. Um, and I still, I still believe in the same as, 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 far, as far as I can see it right now. I would have to listen to God and do what the Bible says. Uh, and the Bible is pretty, pretty strict in that. There's a Bible verse that says, do not repay evil with evil, which is pretty black and white. But, well, in all honesty, I don't know what I would do at that moment. I just hope and pray that God would give me the answer. And from what I read in the Bible, I would say I wouldn't do anything, but, when push comes to shove, I don't know. And that's that's my honest answer. Um, which is not that black and white. They really want to hear black and white answers. But, well, I think it's better to be honest than, than just make up stories. That doesn't work. Um, it's coming from the heart, isn't it? It's coming from your, you know, your moral position. Yeah, that's the thing. And, and a lot of guys try to try to abuse the law. Uh, try to get away with it and just, yeah, they, they, they learned the Bible verses out of their head, but they didn't really believe it. And I, 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 th I think that's wrong. Um, the law is there for a reason. The committee is there for a reason. And you have to serve your country, full stop. Um, and I do get it why they're strict. Too many people try to abuse it. And I don't think that's that's correct. You shouldn't abuse a lot like that. No. I guess it makes it harder for the people who are genuinely objecting to uh, get their case across, I guess. And, and still, you're dealing with kids that are 17 years old. Well, there, there should be a better way. But if you would ask me what would be a better way, I really wouldn't know. If you were a member of the Dutch Communist Party, would they still take you into the army? I don't know, actually. I don't have a clue. I, I, I do think so. The, the only reason that you could apply in this law, politics was not a reason. So if you were in the Communist Party, well, too bad for you. You still have to join the army. Or that was the last option, um, go to jail. I just wondered whether they would consider you such a security risk that they wouldn't want you in anyway. Well, that that would be a good that would be a good option for a lot of, for a lot exactly. of people. Yeah, I guess. a lot of people. There would have been a big flood of people joining. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm afraid if that would work, a lot of people would just join the Communist Party just to get out of the draft. So I'm afraid that that's not going to fly, uh, and with a good reason. I mean, did some people? live abroad or to avoid being conscripted not as far as i know or not, well not as far as i know i did hear the stories from people from the u.s who uh went to canada stuff like that but none uh, i didn't hear anything from dutch people who fled the country uh, either they went into the military service or did uh, the replacement military service or went to jail uh, with West Germany, a uh, number of people went to West Berlin because you couldn't be conscripted into the Bundeswehr if you lived in West Berlin. There were people who 
didn't want to go into the military and didn't want to, to do the replacement military service as well. So they had to go to a, a spe- there was actually a special part of the prison, especially for people like that. They were confined in a special quarter. Uh, and they had to, well, they had to serve for 21 months in a jail. But that's not abiding the law. You should serve your country either, either in, in any way. It's your country. That's where you live in. How confident did you feel that you were going to be able to carry this off when you first stood in front of that military court? Oh, not at all. Not at all. Well, for my fe- my, my thoughts and feelings were were pretty confident. This is what I believe. This is what this is what I stand for. Um, so that, that's that's not a que- that's not that's out of the equation. Um, but as soon as you stand in front of the judge and stand in front of a full committee, well, that, that's that's quite impressive. So you always, I always thought, well, it could be that they decline it, and if they decline it, then that's that's the way it is. At least I did my best, and then I'll have to go into the military service. It is how it is. But if I show up at the pearly gates sooner or later, maybe later. At least I can tell God, well, I, I, at least I did my best. And yes, I did fail, but at least I did my best. So if, if you had had to do military service, you would have obeyed the laws and the training. and If that's the law, that's the law. Yeah. And, and that sounds weird, maybe. But if that's the law, that's the law. The Bible is pretty clear in it. You should listen to your government. And as you say, your government also had a law that entitled you to object on conscientious grounds and do non-military service. And there you go. Uh, so for me, it was, that's the law. But for the guy who was uh, at the medical exam, well, he didn't see it as the law. For some of the people in the committee, yes, they were in the committee, but the way they asked questions and looked at you and they poked in it, not everybody was in favor of the same law. And that I thought was strange. Uh, There is a law, you should abide to it if you like it or not. And now you're in the committee and you try to get around it or I I don't know. I still don't get that, especially the guy at the medical exam. He really went berserk. Did the questions get more difficult as you moved through the process? I mean, how how did that, because you had that first um, tribunal you were in front of, and you've given us some examples of the, the, the questions and your answers there. But I think you have to go through a number of these different hearings. Yeah, well, it, it depends on how your answer is. If you answer with, well, I'm not sure, but I think, well, then you're on shaky ground. Uh, it, it's just not going to work like that. If you're like, well, I do think that God may be told in his Bible, perhaps, well, then you're done. Which is also, I think, strange. I mean, I'm, I, I'm still reading that Bible, I'm still studying it, but I still don't get everything that's in it. But if you're in front of the committee, admitting that you don't get 100% what's written in the Bible is a no-no. You you just don't do that. You don't want to go there. And that that's, that's I don't think that's that's fair. I don't think that's freedom. I think it's freedom when you can say, well, this is what I believe. This is what I read. And maybe I'm wrong, but this is what I read right now. But don't put yourself up as vulnerable. That that was just a no-go for that committee, Um, which I think it it shouldn't be like that. But it was like that. I mean, it was the Cold War. Come on. Um, Gorbachev was just there. So... Things were changing, but still, the, the threat was still real. At least for me, it felt real. So, yeah. I mean, in, in Holland, there was a very large peace movement there 
um, particularly against nuclear weapons, or there appeared to be. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And and, and I, I didn't join them, not at all. <laughs> I didn't walk around with a sign. Uh, there was a, there was a, there was a sign that said "ban the bomb," something like that, and they were huge. There was a military base just around the corner for where we lived. Uh, let's say five clicks from the place where I lived. And they had huge, dem huge demonstrations, people throwing rocks, stuff like that. And I, no, that, that's not my, that's not my piece of cake. I don't think that's, everybody's doing his job. And yes, sadly, sometimes weapons are needed, I'm afraid. Um, and from a theoretical standpoint, I, yeah, it's the same as nuclear energy. Yeah, from a theoretical standpoint of view, I, I do get them. But why would you throw rocks? I mean, the military staff that's working there is just doing their job. And you're throwing rocks? Because <laughs> I, re I remember seeing film of um, anti-nuclear demonstrations with Dutch soldiers in their uniforms on the demonstrations as well. Which I guess you can understand because they're, you know, they're potentially looking at it from a purely being against nuclear weapons, but not being against the defense of their country with conventional weapons, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're living in Poland right now and Ukraine is quite a mess at the moment. Um, and for me, it doesn't matter if I get killed by a nuclear weapon or by a conventional weapon, dead is dead. They are made for the same reasons. I just don't get the difference. And especially what you just said, there were, there were people who were in the military marching against their own military. I, I, I don't get it. You signed up for it. Uh, you signed up for it. You, they also had the option to to use the same law, and they didn't do that. So, well, you signed up for it. That's your job. You better do it. I mean, it, it's interesting, you know, that your feelings about the law of the country, that that almost overrides the individual's beliefs in terms of what they can do with a, a citizen. Okay, in, in Holland, there was a law that allowed you to conscientiously object, but what your saying is if that law wasn't there you wouldn't have refused to carry arms if you were told to by the government yeah that's correct yeah and that might sound weird uh, but hey the law is there so you might as well use it um and yeah it, it is a i was lucky or blessed or whatever name you want to call it that the law was there i wouldn't have known what I would would have done when the law was not there. We know people who are in Russia right now and they, they do not want to go into the military for the same reason that I didn't want to go. They don't want to fight against Ukraine, but they have to. And they try to escape and can't escape. They break their legs on purpose just to get out of it. But the leg will heal in six weeks and then you're back at square one. And there's no way for them to escape. And, and, and I'm so thankful that I'm not in their situation. What would I do? I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. And, and the same goes for, we've got friends in the Ukraine. We know a lot of people in the Ukraine. And a lot of our friends don't want to fight. But it's their country. So they do fight and they do try to protect their country but if you really would ask them do you want to fight no they don't but they don't have an option well thank god that i did have an option for as long as it's an option maybe the russians roll in uh, in poland next week i don't know uh, and i still don't know what i'm going to do i don't did you just get a letter saying 
congratulations you part i know it's not going to be congratulations but yeah we we now accept uh you know that you are a conscientious objector or how did they communicate that to you yeah you you just got a letter and that's it uh no phone call no nothing so you went to quite well in in my 17 year old vision you went through quite an ordeal um for me it felt pretty scary what's going to happen even though my thoughts are pretty pretty black and white but you you'll never know and then the only thing that you'll get is a letter and that's it no phone call no well of course they're not going to say congratulations but they put a lot of time and energy into it i put a lot of time and energy into it and the only thing you get is is a letter and that's it have you still got the letter no, sadly I don't. No, sadly I don't. No, the only thing I've got left are the um, the written out questions and answers from one of the sessions. And that's about it. That's all I've got left. Did your parents support you in your objection? Well, my, my dad didn't have to join the army since he cut his fingers off underneath a sawing machine by accident. So, well, he was lucky. Well, his finger still looks like a mess. But um, they, they did support me in do think what you do and what are the consequences over time and whatever you do it's fine if you join the military if you want to do that and you do you do believe that god wants you to do it do it but you better make sure that you're conscious about what you're doing and they were fine with either choice yeah how long is this process and how many of these different hearings do you have to have before they say, oh, okay, he is really a conscientious objector and we'll let him do social service? Well, you first have to do your medical, then you have to write a letter, uh, then you'll have to show up before the psychiatrist, then you'll have to go to one person. Then you have to go to the committee from three persons. And if they don't believe you, then you'll actually have to go another time. And all in all, it can take more than half a year. And you just don't know if if you'll succeed or not. It's easier to join the army. Then you'll know within a week where you'll be going, then, then it's done and over. But you've got some uncertainty for at least half a year. And after that half a year, you'll have to figure out, together with the government, uh, where you're going to do your replacement military service. And that might take a half a year as well. So some of the guys took more than a year to get everything over with. By replacement military service, what were those roles that you could do? Well, the, the government decided what is... Um, what is of public interest? It had to be of public interest. So you couldn't say, hey, I'm going to work as an electrician for a commercial company. That just didn't work. It had to be of public interest. And they had a list of companies where you could work, so to say. Uh, it wasn't freedom as in I can choose whatever I want to do. They had a list and you had to choose one of them. If If you were in time, if you didn't, do your homework good enough, they would assign a job to you. So one of my friends had to work uh, as a garbage collector for one and a half year. And he stood on a garbage truck for one and a half year. Another friend of mine worked on wheelchairs and did that for one and a half year. I worked at a Congress center uh, as an electrician and we had groups over um, who had congresses there around public interest themes. So that's what I did. Uh, some people worked in a hospital. So it was quite a variety. And yeah, you did have a choice, but no, you did not have a choice. If If you're lucky, you would find a job that would suit you. But most of them were not and were assigned to a garbage truck for a year or one and a half year. Yeah, and you couldn't say, I'm not going to do that. 
then you would go to jail. Um, and the law actually says that you had to properly comply with the assignments and regulations. So it wasn't like, I'm just going to have a fun time. You know what? Screw it all. Um, that was not an option. You had to behave properly. So there was still some sort of military law involved, I guess. But the jobs were pretty, pretty wide. I was lucky. I, I could do my my own trade, electrician and sound engineering. But if you were not lucky, well, there you go. Garbage truck for you it is. One and a half years. And who's paying your wages in that situation? The government? Yeah, the government pays your wages. Um, however, in my case, the Congress Center I worked for had to pay a little bit to the Dutch government. And the Dutch government paid me. So it wasn't like they had free labor. Uh, they still had to pay a little bit for it, but not a lot. So they actually had quite cheap labor, but not free labor. And my pay slip always came from the Dutch government. They paid for my housing. They paid for my wages and stuff like that. So the, the Dutch government st still pays you. Not a lot, but that's okay. And was there any backlash with people in the country who felt that you should be serving in the army? Was it easy to identify people who were in these roles that were conscientious objectors or, or not? For me, it felt like it's a topic that you don't, tell don't ask don't say anything about it yeah it's some sort of being shunned i guess the whole topic not you as a person but the whole topic is shunned when you meet people at a bar uh, especially around that age the conversations were like hey did you join the army what part of the army did you do blah 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 blah, blah. and as soon as you said well i didn't go into the army uh, i did replacement military service well that was the end of the, the discussion <laughs> up to the next beer, and the whole topic was shunned. Nobody said anything about it. It just didn't exist. Um, not in normal life. In, in some churches, it was, a, it was a topic. But in real life, outside of a church, no. No, and it didn't feel like you were, or it didn't feel like for me that I was free to say, these were my thoughts. And it didn't feel like me that I could say, hey, I'm proud. I served the Dutch government. I did, I did serve my country for one and a half year. Um, so did your workmates know why you were there? Yeah, half of them uh, did the same. So half of them were there on a commercial base. They got a normal salary. And the other half were there for replacement service. So everybody you work with knew. But your your friends just didn't want to know. They didn't talk about it, um, like it didn't exist for. But that that's that was that's my feeling. Maybe, maybe it's different for somebody else. But for me, it never felt like you're free to to talk about it. There there are a gazillion Facebook groups for people who served in the military, and so far I didn't find any Facebook group. For objectors in the Netherlands, none. It doesn't exist. Uh, when you look online, there is some info about it. Not a lot, but there is some. But when you try to find personal stories, there is almost none. Like it never existed, but it did exist. I mean, one and a half year of my life was gone by then. Now, your story really intrigued me when you got in contact with me because in the UK we didn't have conscription and a number of NATO countries did as we've illustrated in our in our chat so far but I think your story is particularly interesting because you did want to serve your country but not by bearing arms yeah well th th that's the thing a lot of people expect that you don't want to do anything for your country 
that you're running around with those billboards uh, against nuclear stuff. And it's it's not that black and white. But as soon as you start the topic, it, it seems like everybody looks like you as if you were one of those people who were protesting against anything that has to do anything with military service. And it's that's not the case for me, not at all. Were there any anything like a reserved occupation which meant you wouldn't serve in the army? Do you know? I, no, I, I don't understand your question. Right. So in the UK, in World War Two, and I think World War One, there were certain occupations where the workers would not be called up into the army because it was such an important job. And I'm thinking, like mine, coal miners, and and you know, and other people like that who were in a critical role, even though some coal miners did actually end up volunteering and, you know, and, and serving anyway, but they, I think they, they may have been exempt from conscription. Yeah, there, there, there was not something like that in the Netherlands, but at least not as far as I know. Uh, however, there was an option that if you were married and you were the one that brought in the money, then you wouldn't get called up for the military service. So I do know of some guys who got married when they were 17, 18 years old just to get out of it. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's a reason why you should get married, but hey, they got married and they didn't have to serve. Yeah, or serve two years in jail. <laughs> yeah, go to, yeah, go two years in jail. Well, I'm not sure a marriage lasts longer than, than two years. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. So if you were married and you were the main wage earner, you were yeah. not conscripted. No, that that was one of the options. And there was another option, especially around that time. Some, sometimes they had enough uh, military personnel already and they had some sort of lottery and they sent you a letter. Well, we don't need you. Uh, but that was just a giant lottery. Uh, I never heard of somebody who got one of those letters, but that was the that was the last official option. But well, I, I never, I never spent my money on the lottery anyway. So, if you were in the army, you served eighteen months. Was it? Did you say? No, and uh, when you uh, went into the army, it was twelve months, right. and I had to serve eighteen. Right. Okay. So, if you were in the army and you served twelve months. Are you then called back, I don't know, every couple of years for some further training? I don't know, actually. I, I do know that they that they can call you up until you're 45 years old. So you're not done when, you're, when you've served your year. Um, you still have to show up when the government wants you to show up. But I guess if you've been trained when you were age 17 and you get called up age 45, you're not going to remember which end of the rifle's which. No, point. I don't think so either. So that doesn't give me any um, any confidence that we're going to win any, any war with those guys. That actually backs up your argument. Now, I believe conscription is removed in the Netherlands in 1997. The draft is officially not gone. The law is still there. Everybody in the Netherlands gets a letter when they're 17 or 18 years old, men and women, that they're drafted for the army, even today. However, the letter states that they're not called up. They don't have to join the army right now. But however, on paper, they are drafted. So when the war starts, you still have to join the army. You got the letter. The whole consciousness objection law is also still there. So I'm wondering if anybody these days is going through the same procedure. You're still drafted into the military. Okay, it's only a paper thingy, but still, uh, when the war starts, what are you going to do? When the war starts, yeah, that, 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 that's not going to fly. The, the war starts tomorrow, and then you're like, yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to join the army. Well, you're too late, buddy. You got the letter five years ago you should have done it back then you didn't do it so good luck because when i was doing the research for 
speaking to you, I saw that only recently they've made it equal where women are called up as well as men. So it used to be a men only conscription. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And now it's men and women. Uh, so now you've got men and women, 17, 18 years old, who do get the letter. And I guess that 90% reads the letter, probably thinks, hey, what's this? I never heard of this before. Oh, that's weird. They look it up on Google and they're like, okay, yeah, I'll throw it away. It's nothing. Well, it is something. It's still a draft letter. When I prepared for this, I prepared it the same as if I had to stand in front of a military committee again. And that also paints the picture how I went through all of it. I went through all the legal procedures again. So it still feels for me like a very, you better be prepared or you're screwed, I guess. Which is totally nonsense for a podcast. But it does paint a picture how I went through all of it. It was a very serious business for me. But a topic that's never discussed, don't ask, don't tell. Did that preparation bring back some memories that you'd forgotten about? Well, I've got some brain damage. I did some bad stuff in my life, so my memory ain't that great. So I'm living on written memories. I'm, li I'm living on pictures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But if my brain would function like a normal person, it definitely would. It did bring back the committee, the building where I went to. I do remember the cities where I had to go to. And that's a weird thing. I've got some memory damage and stuff like that I shouldn't be able to remember. That should be gone. But it's not. And that does mean that it really had some impact, some serious impact. I can only remember things from my past which do have a very positive impact, like my wedding day, or a very negative, and then I mean a very negative impact. And everything in between is gone. But I do remember which cities I have to go to. I do remember how the building looked like. I do remember the room. And in my case, that's not a good sign. A question I do want to put to you is how do you reconcile the fact that people are prepared to defend you through force of arms, yet you're not prepared to defend them or defend the country through force of arms well there are different ways to defend your country I guess uh, when push comes to shove and the Russians show up tomorrow it might happen it's a real option um, you do need people who pick up arms and defend their country uh, but you also need people who work in a hospital you also need people who sadly uh, need to dig the graves um, and I'm afraid that's what I'll have to do. So it's not like I'm not defending my country. I'm definitely doing something for my country and probably not the most glamorous work at all. Probably people will hate me that I don't pick up the gun. But it is how it is. But I will defend my country but probably with a shovel, <laughs> probably with medical equipment. I don't know, but I will defend my country. And in all honesty, I hope that people are as proud of what I did for my country as I am proud of them that they, that they are in the army. I'm really I really, well, I'm actually in awe for what they do. It's amazing for what they do. They try to protect, in their way, my life. 
And I do respect that for 110%. But I do hope that they do respect what I do with the same 110% to protect and or build up their country again. It's a different job, but I think the cause is the same. It's your country. You should be proud of it. They are defending your right to to object, to be able to ob- That's object. the thing. That's the thing. Whereas in other countries, that right isn't there. And that's the thing. It isn't there. So I'm very grateful that they do. I mean, we're living in Poland right now. And in my way, I'm trying to serve my country as good as I can in another way. We work with refugees from the Ukraine. We work with homeless people, stuff like that. And it's a tough job, but that's that's the least you should do for humanity, not even for your country, but for humanity. And I'm afraid a lot of people don't do that these days. They They either go into the military for a year, two years, and that's about it. And then they they start a commercial job. Well, okay, that's great. But are, are you still serving your your country or are you still serving God or are you still serving, doing anything good for, for, for humanity? Or are you just making money? We don't get paid. We're volunteers. So we hope we, we, stu- we do get some money next month to pay the rent. But we do try to help people who are homeless. We do try to help the war victims from the Ukraine. So I'm still serving until today. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road. If you'd like to help the project, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week. Thanks for listening right through to the end. I really appreciate it. And maybe check out our store and see if you can find the ideal gift for the Cold War enthusiast in your life. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash store. Thanks for listening.